Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andrew Heap, and I'm the Chief of Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division at Geoscience Australia. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which I am on today, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people watching and listening to the presentation today. I want to thank the conference organisers for providing the opportunity for Geoscience Australia to highlight our work in understanding Australia's mineral, energy and groundwater resource potential. It is with great pleasure that I introduce our presentation titled The Future of Australia's Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Resources at the aptly renamed Resurgence Conference. Before we begin, a little bit about Geoscience Australia. Geoscience Australia is Australia's national geoscience public sector organisation. We are the nation's trusted source of information on Australia's geology and geography for decisions by government, industry and communities. By providing pre-competitive data, information and knowledge, industry is able to invest with confidence in the exploration and development of these resources, maintaining a healthy pipeline of new discoveries and bringing economic and social benefits to the regional communities and Australia more broadly. As these two maps show, Australia has abundant high quality mineral and energy resources that are widely distributed across the country. These resources are expected to last for several decades, even as production increases to meet future demands. As the map on the left shows, for mineral resources, conservative estimates indicate that only 20% of Australia has been well explored, while the remaining 80% being undercover and thereby relatively underexplored. There is enormous potential and opportunities for future resource discoveries by technically de-risking these areas using pre-competitive geoscience data and information to narrow down that exploration search space. Australia's future economic growth and clean energy security will be well supported by our world-class gas resources, together with our increasing renewable energy capacity and our nascent hydrogen industry. Our presentations today will provide you with an overview of the important work and information that we in the Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division are undertaking to unlock the future resource potential of Australia. Just before I hand over to my colleagues for their presentations, I wanted to reinforce the importance of Australia having a successful and growing resources sector, and how Geoscience Australia is supporting that outcome. Australia's minerals, energy and agricultural sectors are well established and continue to be a major contributor to Australia's economy. According to recent estimates, they contributed 11% of Australia's GDP, comprised $330 billion in value to Australia's exports, and employed over half a million people. However, in 2020, we have seen the COVID-19 pandemic change not only Australia's, but the world's economic and operating environments. For Australia, the minerals and energy sectors have particularly been the engine room supporting our economy during this time, and more importantly, will be a critical component of our recovery. For over 70 years, Geoscience Australia has compiled some of the best geoscientific data sets in the world in terms of their quality, coverage, diversity and availability, and they are free to anyone interested in Australia geology. The work undertaken by Geoscience Australia directly supports the growth of the minerals, energy and agricultural sectors. The goals of building Australia's resources wealth and securing Australia's water resources are front and centre in our 10-year strategic plan, Strategy 2028. The Australian Government's $225 million Exploring for the Future program is collecting pre-competitive geoscience data in unprecedented scale and detail across Australia, increasing our understanding of our mineral, energy and groundwater resources. It is one of the most ambitious programs of its type ever undertaken, and the potential rewards are huge. The first phase of the Exploring for the Future program was undertaken from 2016 to 2020, and with funding of $100 million focused on Northern Australia. A recent independent review of the potential return on investment undertaken by ASIL Allen, using just three case studies from that program, estimated the total potential economic returns range from $446 million to over $2.5 billion. Clearly, that's a healthy return on investment. In June this year, the program was extended for a further four years by the Australian Government, with a further $125 million in funding to go nationwide. I'll be talking more about the Exploring for the Future program and the outstanding results from the first phase and what we have planned for the second phase in another session of the conference on Wednesday morning. And I very much encourage you to tune into that presentation. But for now, I'll hand over to my colleague we will talk about our work to support Australia's future minerals discovery, development and sustainability. Hello everybody, I'm Alison Britt and the Acting Director of Mineral Resources Advice and Promotion at Geoscience Australia. 
And I'd like to talk about three broad areas of minerals activity that we are undertaking to support Australia's future in minerals discovery, development and sustainability. Now, most people watching today have probably heard the term critical minerals, but I just wanted to touch on the definition to help explain why critical minerals are important for Australia. For a mineral to be considered critical, it must fulfil two criteria. One, it is essential for modern technology and cannot be easily substituted with a different mineral. And two, there is a risk that the supply of that mineral could be disrupted. Australia has classified 24 minerals and elements as critical minerals. These commodities are listed in Australia's critical minerals strategy and are based on a combination of the critical minerals identified by our partner countries and our nation's geological prospectivity for those minerals. This is a dynamic list that may change as our understanding of Australia's resource potential develops and as demand changes in response to technological and market developments. The future for Australia's critical minerals sector is full of possibility, but it is dependent on Australia attracting investment, innovating in exploration, discovery, processing and downstream value adding, and on having the right infrastructure to support development. Australia has a number of tools at its disposal, such as the Northern Australia Infrastructure Fund, the Export Credit Agency and Austrade, as well as new science and innovation through the Cooperative Research Centres program, the CSIRO, ANSTO and of course Geoscience Australia. The Critical Minerals Facilitation Office has been created to coordinate all these activities. Other countries also wish to increase the resilience of their critical minerals supply chains and are looking to Australia to provide new opportunities. We have the attractive advantages of a large minerals endowment, low sovereign risk and the credentials for responsible mining and development, which is increasingly important to leading companies and their customers. To date, Australia's actions include a Memorandum of Understanding with India that focuses on critical minerals trade, investment and R&D, a commitment with Japan for practical action to diversify critical mineral supply chains with particular priority around rare earths, and discussions with Korea, the EU and the UK about opportunities for cooperation. Australia's most mature relationship is with the United States. In early 2018, the USA and Australia agreed to work together on critical minerals exploration, extraction, processing, research and development. Geoscience Australia and the United States Geological Survey were quickly joined by the Canadian Geological Survey and the three organisations have been working closely together on a number of initiatives to strengthen our critical minerals resilience. In particular, we have created the Critical Minerals Mapping Initiative, which provides a structure for the collaboration. Our goals are to promote critical minerals discovery in all three countries by developing a better understanding of the critical mineral content in Australian and North American ore bodies, to understand critical minerals byproduct opportunities, and to identify new sources of supply through critical minerals potential mapping. We recently published a fact sheet that summarises the initiative and activities. It's available online and later in the year, our EOS article will explain the technical details of the research and how you can help build up this knowledge base. Domestically, Geoscience Australia is working on quite a number of projects that incorporate critical minerals. These include projects that determine the distribution of critical minerals in alkaline and associated rocks, in lithium tantalum pegmatites, sediment hosted base metal deposits and in iron oxide copper gold deposits, such as Olympic Dam in South Australia. We are working with partners such as the CSIRO, the Australian National University and the University of Adelaide to understand the composition of the fluids responsible for critical minerals enrichment in these deposit types, which will aid discovery and potentially the processing needed for extraction. All of this work will be available on the Australian Critical Minerals Portal as part of Geoscience Australia's data discovery tool. The Critical Minerals Portal is being developed as a single gateway for accessing all critical minerals data sets and more, along with a range of tools for integration, interrogation and decision making support. Now while critical minerals are hugely topical, they are just one part of the broader minerals program at Geoscience Australia, of which data acquisition and mapping is fundamental. As the National Custodian of Geoscience Knowledge and Information, we hold a very wide range of data sets and maps which are constantly refined and improved with new ones added as new techniques are developed. These provide a view of the physical and chemical architecture of Australia, all the way from the surface to the bottom of the tectonic plate, 
and are a fundamental evidence base for informed resource exploration and investment. A recent airborne electromagnetic survey called AEM is the world's largest flown to date. From east to west, it spans 2,000 kilometres and the first phase of the survey is as big as France and Germany combined. The survey was flown with 20 kilometre line spacing and was supplemented with infill company data. The results reflect the physical properties of the subsurface rocks as a function of their electrical conductivity. This approach gives us a view to around 200 metres depth below the surface. At first order, we are able to identify the basement in dark blue and the sedimentary basins shown in warmer colours. Looking closer, we can identify major faults and conductors that might be related to mineralisation and specific lithological units such as black shales that can also host mineralisation. Using the company infill data, we can map at higher resolution to refine local features such as paleo valleys for place of deposits or potash or map the variations in water composition. The unprecedented scale of this work has sparked global interest. It is a great example of government initiatives enabling companies to explore more efficiently and effectively. Data collection is now underway across the remainder of Western Australia, funded by the WA State Government and managed by Geoscience Australia. To map deeper than the 200 metres imaged by AEM, we turn to other geophysical methods. One of our crown jewel data sets is the Magnetic Intensity Map of Australia. This is a fundamental data set used so often by so many that it is easy to take it for granted. Last year we released the seventh edition which adds over 200 new surveys to the national data set, all leveled to a consistent national baseline by Geoscience Australia's in-house geophysical experts. Another of our flagship products is the gravity image of the continent. Here is the latest edition that will be released on the 25th of September. We have drawn together onshore and offshore data to make this a spectacular and beautiful image. It is a foundational data set for understanding the buried geology. Now the power of mapping at various depths, for example down to 200 kilometres at the base of the tectonic plate, is illustrated here. The map on the left shows the thickness of the plate, determined from seismic tomography. The thicker areas are blue and the thinner areas are red. The map also shows that sedimentary hosted base metal deposits, the bold circles, all sit on the edge of thick plate regions. This relationship provides a powerful way to predict the likely locations of undiscovered base metal deposits in Australia, as shown by the dark line in the right hand image. Finally, as part of our data discovery tool, we have developed a number of decision support and assessment tools. Geoscience Australia's data discovery tool provides easy access to a multitude of comprehensive geological data sets and tools to help identify prospective areas for mineral discovery. If you are planning exploration drilling, the portal can help answer questions about the thickness of the cover rock or existing drill hole information. If you are planning a new mine site, the portal can help answer questions about water resources, existing infrastructure, or the best place for new infrastructure. Lastly, one of the most exciting tools in the portal is Economic Fairways. This tool enables a user to ask, what mineral tonnages and grades would I need for a profitable mine? This example shows the net present value of a 10 million tonne nickel discovery at 1.5% grade using a combination of depth of cover metal price, exchange rate, and ore body geometry. The resulting heat map shows the blue areas where you are unlikely to make money and the red areas where a discovery could be commercial. The strongest influence on profitability is depth of cover, but interestingly, the heat map also shows the economic effects of state royalties and proximity to infrastructure. Too often in the past, companies have spent millions of dollars drilling only to walk away because the economics didn't stack up. This tool enables some of the pre-feasibility to be done before drilling. And on that positive note, I thank you for your interest in Geoscience Australia's minerals activities and would now like to hand you to my colleague who will talk about the future of Australia's energy resources. Hello, I'm Tom Bernicke. I'm the Director for the Energy Resources Advice and Promotion section at Geoscience Australia and I'd like to talk to you about the future of Australia's energy resources today. 
very clearly these resources will play a very important role in stimulating the economy in the post-COVID-19 scenario, but also the resources will play a critical role in enabling the expansion of our manufacturing industry. In the longer term, our energy resources will be utilised to accelerate the transition to a low carbon economy and ultimately establishing Australia as a world-class hydrogen export industry. When we look at Australia's energy resources across the continent, we can see that these resources are widely distributed. These resources are expected to last several decades and Australia's future economic growth and clean energy security will be well supported by our world-class natural gas resources. And of course, together with our increasing renewable energy capacity and emerging hydrogen industry, we will be on track to achieve a low carbon economy. Looking at Australia's energy production, uh, we can very clearly see here on this graph that it is coal, natural gas and uranium that provide the greatest energy resource in a global context. The grace production has continued to increase substantially, mainly by the rapid expansion of uh, Australia's LNG industry and is earmarked to, for further increases. Interestingly, Australia accounts for 11% of the world's uranium production, but production is declining as output winds down the, in the range of mine. And you can see the quite prominent contribution of uh, uranium makes to the energy production um, given that the graph is showing the petajoules and not money. So the energy value provided by uranium is very, very significant. Looking at Australia's energy trade balance, uh, this picture emerges on the left hand side. You can see our export earnings, coal, uranium and natural gas are the main earners. And on the other side, in red, you can see that Australia is very much dependent on importing mainly liquid hydrocarbons, petroleum, and also, we must not forget, petroleum is not only used for transportation fuels, but also for the refined products that Australia continues to keep importing. When we look at Australia's energy export earnings, again, very clear that it is coal and natural gas that provides the most income to the Australian economy and to the nation. Many people may have heard that there is a, a predicted energy security or a gas shortfall on the East Coast market. And this is exemplified by this graph on the left hand side here. Here is projected the Eastern and South Australian gas production with supply from the existing projects and committed developments. If all this is going ahead as planned, by 2024, we will see a supply shortfall along the East Coast market. Even, and this is the graph on the right hand side, even if all projected and supply from available resources, including uncertain and undeveloped projects are coming online, the shortfall still will kick in at 2030. So it is important that the Australian uh, government supports the development of additional gas resources very rapidly. So looking at where the gas resources may lie, we look at this map here and very clearly the Northwest Shelf is obviously one of the most important contributor to Australia's natural gas resource. In southeastern Australia, Otway and Gippsland Basins have produced gas volumes for many, many years. In Gippsland Basin, over 50 years of production and sees some of the major fields now in decline and efforts are underway to add to the existing gas volumes. Then on the east coast, in Queensland especially, most of the natural gas is derived from coal seam gas. And then we have other areas in the middle of Australia, the Cooper Basin again, a mainstay in supplying energy to southeastern Australia, but also production is now in decline. And then we have new discoveries out in the Perth Basin, which will provide additional volumes to gas mainly for Western Australia. The government is also encouraging the exploration for new gas resources or for new hydrocarbon resources overall by the annual offshore acreage release. So this year, we had 42 new areas were released at the end of August. As you can see, again, the Northwest Shell features most prominently. And it's very interesting to see that the Bonaparte Basin is a new focus of industry interest. 
Also very clear on this map is the underexplored nature of the southern margin and also on the southwestern margin. However, as I pointed out, the Otway and Gippsland Basin will play and continue to play a very important role to supply extra gas to the southeastern Australian gas market. Geoscience Australia is very much involved in assessing the untapped potential of um, Australia's uh, sedimentary basin, uh, especially with a focus on many of the underexplored regions. For example, in uh, recent years, uh, publications were provided giving an overview on the uh, untapped potential of frontier areas, so two volumes on onshore basins was published and also we have a publication describing the geological inventory of offshore frontiers. The main aspect here is that it really analyzes the critical exploration aspects and asks the geoscientific questions that need to be answered in order to enhance our understanding of the prospectivity. So comparing Australia's total energy resource base by looking at renewables and non-renewables energies on the left hand side you can see the focus of renewable energy projects and production areas really much uh, along the eastern seaboard where the major population centres are. We looked at the other map before, so this is the uh, distribution of non-renewable energies across the continent and really to match these at some point in time and to increase the availability of non-renewable energies, we will require the implementation and the building of additional infrastructure. Australia is also well known to host uh, significant volumes of unconventional gas resources. This map here um, provides an overview on the prospective gas resource potential here. And although there is no shale gas production yet, we will have a little bit of a much better understanding of what the overall producibility of these resources are when the Beta Lu Subbasin and the Canning Basin and the Cooper Basin are commencing uh, their production uh, in the near future. Uh, as I pointed out, um, to bring all this online, uh, there is a need for supporting infrastructure, including an expansion of the existing pipelines network. And more importantly, it is very, very critical that any operation in the unconventional space obtains the so social license to operate. So that leads me to hydrogen. Um, is hydrogen the future low emissions fuel? Is this a rhetoric question? The Australian government very recently in November 2019 released the National Hydrogen Strategy. And it talks about jobs and growth, the high value jobs, the opportunity to establish new export industry and the application of advanced technologies to really enable uh, the transition to a low carbon economy powered by hydrogen in the longer term. And ultimately, it's all about the cost of hydrogen production. So the cost of hydrogen production, as indicated on this chart here, is coming down. Importantly, on the left-hand side here, in the top two rows, you see natural gas and carbon capture and storage, and coal and carbon capture and storage playing an important role to enable the transition to a more renewable energy involvement in hydrogen production. So, this is all about the change from blue hydrogen to green hydrogen. So blue hydrogen involving carbon capture and storage, the price will need to come down to below $2 per kilogram. And that is forecast to be achievable by 2030, as you can see here. Fully renewable hydrogen, green hydrogen, ultimately will be the most economic energy commodity by 2050 and possibly will really ramp up very rapidly following the 2030 achievable threshold of $2 per kilogram of hydrogen. So in this context, um, uh, I'd like to just very briefly um, provide an overview on the CCS project in Australia. Australia is on the forefront of carbon capture and storage research, is a, um, a global player and has numerous projects that are already um, underway. Most people would have heard of the Gorgon LNG project. It started in 2019. It's globally the largest sequestration project and is capable of sequestering three to four million tons per annum. Then we have the Southwest Hub project. It's an injection research facility. 
And we have the Surat Basin project, also another demonstration project, which is targeted to sequester up to 200,000 tons of uh, CO2. Importantly, down in the Otway Basin is the CO2 CSC Otway project, which is a research facility very clearly aimed at understanding the injection parameters, but also uh, using the technology to monitor what happens to carbon dioxide in the subsurface after injection. Other projects include Carbonet's uh, Gippsland project. It's one of the first areas where we have an active acreage permit and tenement that is exclusively used for investigating the pore space required to sequest carbon dioxide. Other areas include the Cooper Basin underground storage project in combination with enhanced oil recovery. And the same is true for the Mooney CO2 EOR project that also is a combination of storage versus um, enhanced oil recovery. So with this I uh, um, virtually finish off now by talking about uh, Geoscience Australia's hydrogen projects. There are three uh, aspects to this. First of all it's all about geospatial analysis. Where are the most appropriate areas for establishing a hydrogen industry? Secondly, what is the economic variation to establish where is the best possible way to economically establish hydrogen export industries? And we can do this by the Economics Fairway tool, which is a web-based discovery tool really highlighting the existing and available infrastructure components that are required to drive this hydrogen industry further. And then also we are about to map opportunities for seasonal hydrogen storage ultimately, including the availability of, uh, of salt and depleted gas fields. So this is an example of our um, uh, discovery, uh, data discovery tool or the GA portal. Many aspects on this portal can be addressed and accessed by uh, the user. It not only talks about hydrogen, you heard other people talk about this GA portal before. It is really a discovery tool that provides information about all geoscientific aspects relevant to Australia. So with this I'd like to finish. Australia has a vast energy resource base offering multiple investment opportunities. The readily available energy resources can be utilised to transition to a low carbon economy and overall immediately these resources can be used to stimulate the economy in the post-COVID scenario. So with this I hand over to my colleague who will talk about a, a resource that possibly some of us may take for granted. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Hashim Carey, Geoscience Australia's Acting Director for our Groundwater Advice and Data section. It may interest you that freshwater represents less than 3% of our total available water globally. Of this, nearly 69% is held up in ice caps. We might consider surface water to be more abundant and is easily seen, but it only represents 0.3% of fresh water. Groundwater is considerably more abundant, estimated to represent over 30% of the Earth's fresh water, yet it is poorly understood. Therefore, groundwater is the lifeblood of Australia for many different people, industries and purposes. From sustaining our natural environment, to providing drinking water, to supporting different industries such as mining, agriculture and farming. Our reliance on groundwater is only likely to increase with population growth, climate change and the development expansion. Consequently, it's important that we continue to build our understanding of the quantity, quality and sustainability of groundwater resources in Australia. In Australia, Groundwater represents 30% of available water and supports an estimated $6.8 billion in economic activity annually. To put this economic reliance in context, the pink areas on this map are areas of the country that either greatly rely or completely dependent on groundwater. As you can see, that is much of the continent. Securing Australia's water resources is an imperative for Geoscience Australia's Strategy 2028. The following highlights some of our work towards this objective. Exploring for the Future was a $100.5 million four-year Australian government funded program completed on the 30th of June 2020. It provides a holistic picture of the potential mineral, energy and groundwater resources in Northern Australia. 
The groundwater component of the EFTF program focus on addressing groundwater resource knowledge gaps to support future opportunities for economic development via irrigated agriculture, extractive industries, and increased security for community water supplies. Harnessing the groundwater opportunities requires thorough investigation of groundwater systems and resources. As such, the existing program comprised both of targeted regional investigations and analysis of groundwater prospectivity more broadly across the region. Five regions were selected for new targeted geoscience studies, these being in the East Kimberley, the Northern Stewart Corridor, both Howard's East and the Daly River Basin, the Southern Stewart Corridor from Tennant Creek to Alice Springs, the Upper Burdekin and the Surratt and Galilee Basins. Common to all exploring for the future groundwater projects is the integration of multiple data sets that together provide a more complete story of the geology and hydrogeology of a region. Our groundwater program component involved collecting, analysing and interpreting a wide range of geoscience data sets. These range from satellite remote sensing, airborne geophysics and ground geophysics, to groundwater level and chemistry, as well as drilling, lithology and stratigraphic mapping. The outputs of our Exploring for the Future work are supporting and informing the development of water management plans by regulators, as well as identifying important groundwater processes which can inform conceptual understanding. Our work also provides valuable information to communities, mines and exploration areas, as well as environmental understanding. We make our data and information available in a variety of formats and through several delivery mechanisms. An important aspect of our program has been understanding the needs of our end users from our products and data. These are a range of outputs pertinent to a variety of stakeholders from policymakers and water managers to better support decision making, to businesses, landholders and communities to better understand the water resources available to them. We have made this new data and information freely available to all interested parties. The new Exploring for the Future program data portal is a cornerstone for discovering our data as well as accessing it through Geoscience Australia's regular data delivery channels. This image shows the variety of scales and types of studies we've undertaken, from small regional groundwater assessments such as the East Kimberley and Daly River, to national scale Wasant Paleo Valley mapping and national scale geophysics via the AUSAEM Regional Airborne Surveys. Geoscience Australia ascribes the FAIR data principles, those being findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. This is reflected in our efforts to develop readily accessed tools to ensure the equitable discovery and access of our data via our visualisation portal. An exemplar is the hydrochemistry database and associated web services. These data layers are a compilation of data acquired during Exploring for the Future and legacy data sets held by Geoscience Australia and its forebears. The consistency of data acquired and managed by GA is a fundamental asset to building confidence in our data holdings. This consistency also lowers the effort for data access by applying novel visualisation approaches to our legacy data and enabling new data to be readily accessed via our corporate databases. Providing technical advice to decision makers. Geoscience Australia is collaborating on the Geological Bioregional Assessments Program with the CSIRO and the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment. The focus for the assessment program is the potential impacts that may arise from shale and tight gas developments on water resources and the environment. The program covers three regions. The Cooper GBA region, which spans northwest Queensland to the northeast of South Australia. The Isa GBA region, which covers parts of northern Queensland, extending east from the Northern Territory border. And the Beedaloo GBA region, which lies southeast of Catherine in the Northern Territory. Several of the key program aims are to encourage exploration, making new gas resources available to market in five to ten years, to improve community understanding of the shale and tight gas industry, to increase the understanding of the potential impacts posed by shale and tight gas developments, as well as increasing the efficiency of assessment and ongoing regulation through development of robust assessment materials, the identification of effective monitoring and management practices, and improved reporting and data management. The program has recently released and published the Stage 2 Baseline Analysis Reports as of the 15th of May 2020. These analysis include tight and shale gas development profiles, the characterisation of surface and groundwater resources, 
the identification of protected environmental and cultural heritage matters, impact hazards identification and prioritisation for further analysis, as well as the qualitative assessment examples of well integrity and hydraulic fracturing. The stage three technical work is currently underway with the program due for completion by 2021 in June. Stage three work includes fit for purpose impact and risk analysis of potential impacts to water resources. This analysis and advice provision is done with timely engagement on likely end users, including local communities and councils, state and territory governments, and gas and agribusiness representatives. This has helped ensure that the GBA program is well targeted in what it produces. To summarise, the overview you've just seen is the spear tip of Geoscience Australia's groundwater efforts to secure our water resources. We will continue to inform the business community on securing water resources as part of our extended Exploring for the Future program. I'll now pass back to Andrew to close this presentation. Thank you, Alison, Tom and Hashem for that fantastic overview of Geoscience Australia's programs to better understand our mineral energy and groundwater resources. In Australia, we are supported by national, state and territory governments who all recognise the importance of the strong minerals, energy and agricultural sectors to our economy and for the Australian people. Programs such as the Geoscience Australia led Exploring for the Future program will continue to identify new resource opportunities and discoveries for industry and provide evidence to support decisions by government and communities for many years. You have heard today about the range of data and information Geoscience Australia has through its online data discovery tool. I encourage you to visit this online portal at Geoscience Australia's website with the address shown at the bottom of the slide. In closing, it's important to recognise that there are many resources yet to be discovered and developed. Through our world-class approaches and unparalleled national data sets, which are the envy of the world, Australia is well placed to continue to meet our own needs and supply the world reliably and responsibly with the resources needed for the 21st century and beyond. Thank you for your attention today.